Hello and welcome to GameSec. This time around we're talking about some games that just cannot decide what the hell they want to be. Yeah, you're playing along in an action platformer and then all of a sudden, what? It's a shooter? Wait, no, it's an RPG next. What? What the hell? What's going on here? What? Just make up your mind, game. <laughs> Stupid game. Let's talk about some of these games. How about Toy Story on the Genesis? It's also on the Super Nintendo. This late title was inspired by Clockwork Knight on the Saturn and it's amazing for a lot of reasons. First and foremost are the technical aspects of the game. I already talked about these a lot in one of our Pushing Hardware Limits episodes, so I won't go into all that here. But they really did fit a lot of stuff onto this cartridge. Sometimes it feels like every level features an entirely new game engine. It starts out as kind of a weird side-scrolling platformer. It takes a while to get used to the controls and how the game works, what you can jump on, and all that. It's not the world's best platformer, but once you figure it out, you should do okay. Just be aware that your hitbox feels like it's bigger than the entire screen sometimes. Everything can hurt you easily. It feels like no two levels have you doing quite the exact same thing. And soon, the game changes completely up into an overhead racer similar to Micro Machines. You're not actually racing here, but you have to navigate the track, touch buds, collect his batteries, and make it to the end. Then it's off to avoiding food that falls from tables because I guess that's just what food does at Pizza Planet. And what 2D platformer would be complete without a 3D Doom style level? You're not shooting or killing anything here, but instead you're finding three-eyed aliens hidden in the machine and taking them back to their collective within a strict time limit. Then there's a third person racer where you're after Buzz. Again, you're not actually racing. It's somewhat similar to the overhead RC car park gameplay wise, but this time it's outside in 3D and it looks really cool. Then you get kind of a horizontal shooter, but without the shooting as Buzz flies you back to the car where Andy awaits. Suffice it to say, this game can't fit into a single genre and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Developer John Burton is working on a director's cut of this game to improve some of the gameplay aspects of this one and I'm really looking forward to that. It might even be available to download by the time you watch this. I honestly have no idea since we make these episodes so far in advance. But visit his channel, Game Hut, for more details. Here's Sigma Star Saga for the Game Boy Advance developed by WayForward and published by Namco. It's funny because you can tell the game was developed by WayForward just by looking at their female characters. I certainly don't hate it, but I'm sure it offends some people out there, but you know what, that's their problem. The game comes to you as an RPG. Or wait, it's a shooter! Wait, no, it's both! Let's take a look at this different approach to the RPG genre. As an RPG, you'll do a lot of the stuff you're used to. You'll wander around large space stations talking to people to get information. Of course this information helps you out, and it also helps you further the storyline. As with all RPGs, if you get stuck, just talk to everyone and you'll find your way. Besides the space stations, you'll go down to the surface of different planets. These exploration missions are pretty fun. There's lots of enemies that you'll fight, but you won't do it in a turn-based battle like other RPGs. It's all real time and you have your little gun which kills enemies quickly. Don't look for experience points here because you won't get any. I thought this was a bit weird and felt like I deserved XP because, you know, I'm killing stuff. You'll find many things on these trips, like this radar thingy that will help you get to new areas that were previously blocked. You'll also find gun data here and there. Now this isn't for the gun that's in your hand. This is for the ship that you'll use when fighting enemies in the shooter segments. There's over 50 types of gun data that you can collect and you can make thousands of different combinations if you really want to waste time. You can customize the cannon, bullet type, and the impact of the bullet. I don't really like to waste a lot of time and found a few of these that suited me just fine. I like this as it's not deep and it's really fun and easy to try different combinations. The shooter levels are like the random battles that you're used to in a traditional RPG. As you're exploring the planet, you'll just randomly get beamed up into a ship that's cruising in space. You won't always have the same ship every time, but you'll always have the same weapons that you powered up on the planet's surface below. The story explains it that there are drone ships patrolling the skies and tunnels. If the drone senses danger, it will warp the nearest pilot into the cockpit and he must destroy the enemies. And that's you! It's such a cool idea and I like that you're sometimes in a fast fighter looking ship and other times you're in what looks like to be a transport ship. These battles are where you get your experience points and do your leveling up. 
On the side of the screen is the number of ships that you have to destroy and then the battle will be over. As you kill enemies, they drop white orbs and these are your XP so do your best to collect them. You do have an HP bar on the top and if you get shot down like I often did, you'll come back immediately to finish the job. Unfortunately, there's no way for you to heal yourself during these battles, but that's okay since they're usually over pretty quickly. So I haven't beaten this game yet, but what I've played is pretty fun and definitely a nice change to the genre. Sure, the shooter levels can get a little repetitive and boring at times, but they're a lot more entertaining than the super repetitive battles in a traditional RPG. So if you're a fan of shooters and RPGs, then you should try this game. It's quite good, and as I've said before, WayForward is definitely a worthy developer. A good game for today's topic is Back to the Future Part 3 on the Genesis. Actually, it's a good example, not a good game. Because, dear God, this is one of the worst games ever made. Each and every stage has completely different gameplay. You start out riding a horse as Doc Brown, and even if you're playing on a CRT, you barely have any time to react. You can try again and again, and you're only going to hate your life more and more each time you try. The next level, though, is better as it's a shooting gallery. But of course the control is still weird as you need to press down to point your gun up. There are three levels of height you can aim your gun at. Are you a crack shot at this? Cause I'm not. Then you have a weird isometric level where you throw pies or plates or whatever. And you don't throw the plates in the direction that you press either, it's, it's very hard to make sense of. It's like you need to press left to throw them up. The last stage is the final one and it's the best, though it still sucks. You're on top of a train throwing plates at bad guys. You're also trying to reach the engine to make it go fast so you can go back to the future. It's tough and it's easy to fall off. Also, why is this entire game super dark? I mean, seriously. Did they develop the game on monitors that had the brightness cranked way up so that they thought it looked normal? That's the only thing that makes any sense to me. Still, I'm amazed that the developers were proud enough of this one to put their names on it, but they did. I really want these guys to explain themselves. Avoid this game at all costs. Follow GameSack on Twitter at GameSack and at GameSack Dave on Instagram at GameSack Official and check out our Patreon if you want. Wow, Dave, I don't know about this. I can't handle so much variety. Yeah, you know, we're used to just one thing, but now this they throw this at us? What the hell? My brain, it just can't compute. Well, just settle down. We'll get through it. Let's do it. This is The Guardian Legend on the NES, developed by Compile and published by Broderbund in 1988. Broderbund? Or is it Broderbund? Broderbund. Whatever. All they make is, like, publishing software now, so... Pfft, who cares? There's a huge planet called Natu, and it's hurtling towards Earth. If that's not bad enough, it's filled with evil aliens that are ready to do foul and disgusting things to the people that survive the impact of another planet smashing into theirs. As the guardian of Earth, you can't let this happen, so off you go to Nadju and find that luckily there's a self-destruct mechanism. For the entire planet, <laughs> yes. You have to activate the 10 safety devices to destroy the planet. Sounds pretty easy, right? So let's go! The game starts out on a shooter level. It's moving fast and all you have is a little pea shooter to destroy all these aliens and debris that's coming on screen. You can't shoot at all and for the most part I found myself just trying to dodge as much as I could. But wait, that's the last thing you should do! Your score is also your experience, and the higher the score, the higher your level, which in turn extends your life bar. You want a large life bar because the shooter levels get tougher the further you get. Once you defeat the first boss, the game transforms into an overhead almost dungeon crawler. This labyrinth gets freaking huge! Your goal here is to make it to the next corridor or shooter segment. Luckily there's a map on the subscreen which flashes the area that you need to reach for the next corridor. It's not easy making your way around since it's basically a large maze. Very rarely is there a direct line between you and your goal. It's okay though because exploring is pretty fun. You'll kill lots of enemies which will help boost your levels. Be sure to shoot everything because you'll get experience for it. You'll also find many different power-ups which will let you shoot faster or carry more chips. Chips are important since they serve two purposes. One is currency so you can buy new sub-weapons. 
and two as ammunition for those sub-weapons. You start out with a max of 50 chips and almost everything costs more than that, but it won't be long before you find an icon to let you carry more chips. That's why you have to scavenge these areas. Sure, you could skip and try your best just to get to the goal, but that won't give you any advantages down the road when the game gets much harder. Once you do get to a new quarter, you go back into a shooter level. Your weapon is more powerful and you have all those sub-weapons which will help you out quite a bit. I really like that you can use your sub-weapons in both areas and you can switch them anytime just by going onto the select screen. As I said before, the game's dungeon crawling area is huge. Once you start collecting keys, you can warp from one area to another so you don't have to tread across the humongous map constantly. The game is insanely fun and highly addictive thanks to the awesome graphics and really good controls. Hey, you know what else makes this game awesome? Yep, it's the soundtrack. A lot of great melodies that really bring you back to the glory days of the NES. So if you're looking for a fun game that adds some serious difficulty later on and will put your skills to the test, then look no further. It's definitely worth a try. Here's the breathtaking crossfire for the Genesis from the ever so exciting Kyugo Trading Company. Is it a shooter? Is it a run and gun? Why it's both for the price of one! You can't beat that! Well actually you can by getting pretty much any other game. This one is known as Super Airwolf in Japan and is based on the Airwolf TV series. But sadly in the US we got no Airwolf tie-in. It starts out as a vertical shooter where you pilot your helicopter. It's pretty standard shooting action here. You have your regular shot and this can be powered up. You have a bomb that will help clear out enemies, and you also have a turbo thing which makes you fast and invincible for a short time. Oh, and have fun trying to collect these power-ups. Not only do they run away from you when you fly towards them, but you need to collect all three of them to get the item. After what seems like 30 years, you zoom in really close to the ground and shoot stuff up with your helicopter. You're invincible here and basically you're clearing the way for what happens next. Now you're playing a run and gun shooting down bad guys that explode. But don't worry, you explode too if you get hit. You can jump high in order to shoot things that are higher than you are. This doesn't always work out well, but it helps kill things that otherwise could shoot at you. There are also walkie talkies to collect. These will let you call in Super Airwolf to clear out the screen while you lie down and take a nap. After this, you go inside the base. In here, you're looking for a hostage to rescue all the while shooting down bad guys. Once you get the hostage, you escape and suddenly you're back into an overhead shooter again. After another 30 years, you finally get to a rather bland boss fight. Win this and you're back at the selection screen. You can then buy new equipment at the store with the money you earn. And then you choose your next mission and then choose your weapons. And then do it all over again. There's not a lot of variety in the stages, the enemies, or even the music in this game. It's tough to keep your interest. Hell, it's tough to even stay awake while playing it. The run and gun segments are definitely the best part of the game though, especially when you're inside looking for the hostages. I wish these areas were a lot bigger. I also wish the overhead shooter levels were shorter and had more variety. Not a game I'd recommend to anyone really, but nobody ever mentions it. Here's the Adventures of Bayou Billy for the NES by Konami. The Adventures of Bayou Billy. Billy's well-endowed girlfriend, Annabelle, has been kidnapped and you gotta get her back. But it's not gonna be easy and that's the damn truth. This game has three different playstyles for you to try and enjoy and even master as you hunt down Annabelle and her kidnapper. The Adventures of Bayou Billy. The first playstyle is a typical beat-em-up where you fight goons and alligators with your fists and feet. Once you clear the screen, you can move forward to the next area and fight some more. This is the hardest part of the game hands down. The levels are long and the enemies are strong and take lots of hits. They also deal out a good amount of damage. They'll drop weapons for you to pick up and even full-sized pre-cooked turkeys to help give you life and energy. Even with all the turkeys that you eat, it's easy to see your life bar drain very quickly. No lie here, the first level took over an hour to get past and there's no freaking boss fight at the end. Of the 8 stages in the game, 5 are beat em ups. The Adventures of Fire Billy. The second type of gameplay is a side-scrolling shooting game. 
It plays very similar to Operation Wolf and other games like that. The Zapper is the preferred control method, but you can also use the normal controller if you don't have one or if you're playing on a modern TV. These stages are a lot easier and the enemies have generous hitboxes. They drop lots of power-ups like life and extra bullets. You don't have infinite ammo, so be sure to pick up bullets when you can. The Adventures of Bayou Billy. The last genre this one tries to be is a combat driving game. You drive in your Bayou Jeep that's equipped with a machine gun on the front to take out other Jeeps. It also has an open roof for you to throw grenades at airplanes or helicopters that are coming at you. They do have nice colors and the clouds look good, but that's as pretty as it gets. And they're quite tough as not only do you lose a life anytime you bump into anything, you're also racing a strict timer. I used to play this game a lot back when it came out. I've only ever made it to the sixth level. It's beyond difficult and at times frustrating. Apparently the Japanese game called Mad City is much easier and has lots more content. I'm gonna have to get that version I think as I'd like to see the ending. The Adventures of Fire Billy. All right, Dave, does it piss you off that some of these games just can't stick to a genre? Uh, for the most part, Joe, no, it doesn't. And especially in the case of games like Bayou Billy, where the beat em up stages are just ridiculously hard, it's kind of nice to break it up with a driving sequence or maybe a zapper game. By the way, those driving sequences can suck the farts out of my ass. I hate them. <laughs> yeah, now, I'm not sucking any farts out of anybody's ass, but... Dude, why not? You know, it just doesn't sound appealing. Anyways, we got a couple more games, so let's just get right back to it. This is Final Lap Twin for the TurboGrafx-16. Is it a racing game? Is it an RPG? Does it excel at either? Dave briefly mentioned this one, but screw him, he sucks. The main portion of this game is a standard racing game where you race to place high enough and advance to the next track. There's nothing really special here at all. The graphics aren't much better than the original pole position. The music during the races isn't bad though. Like I said, it's fairly basic and back when our expectations were pretty low, this would have been kinda entertaining but there's also a quest mode which is more or less your standard RPG. Your mission is to become the world champion and also to save the world. I mean, you probably have to save it, it's an RPG after all. The random battles are one lap races and you earn money whether you win or lose, but of course you get a lot more if you win. If you lose, you also get put back into the original town. You can buy lots and lots of parts for your car. Then you can face off against the local boss. His race is three laps and if you win, you get a secret part like a warp box or a map. You have a fairly convoluted password you can input if you want to continue your game and be sure to write it down correctly or oops, oh well. The RPG mode is tough, but not because of the difficulty, but because it's so damn tedious. The races are boring and take place to the world's most boring music. There's only two racetracks and they both look extremely bland. It would be better if I were allowed to run from all of the random battles. Just that one little thing would improve the game tenfold. There is a lot of grinding in this game, but I don't like being forced to do it when I don't want to. Still, I've gotta give props to Namco for putting in a fairly fleshed out quest mode in this. It showed that they cared about their customer, at least a little. Believe it or not, Namco had tried this approach earlier with World Court Tennis, also on the TurboGrafx-16. The main part of the game is a crappy tennis simulator, and it also has a built-in RPG mode that works very similar to Final Lap Twin. The main tennis game isn't that hot, and it really doesn't help that I have absolutely no interest in tennis at all. The graphics are, well, they're just plain, and everything looks squashed, especially the court. The RPG mode has the king of tennis sending you out on a journey to stop the evil tennis king and restore tennis to the land. So that's right, you have to save the world. And the NPCs give you great information like get information from people. Gee, thanks. Another one tells me that this town is Chicago? Wow, Chicago has sure gone downhill. I mean, there's only like six or seven people living here now. 
Of course, the random battles are quick tennis matches, and since I suck at this game, I lose every battle without exception. I could buy parts to power up my tennis dude, but damn, everything is expensive here. So it goes without saying that grinding is a must. Honestly, I can find no positive aspects to this game. Just stick to Final Lap Twin. And no, we didn't forget about Blaster Master by Sunsoft on the NES. The game with a storyline that leaves you with more questions than answers. Like why is there radioactive stuff in my front yard? Why is there a huge world underground? Where did this battle tank and Sue come from? And that's just to start with. It really doesn't matter, and if you've played this title, you know it's about as solid as a game can get. The game is broken up into two playstyles. The first is a side-scrolling action type. You drive around in your tank platforming and blasting your cannon at everything that moves. The tank controls splendidly, making platforming easy and fun. It even has secondary weapons like lightning and missiles that are very useful for enemies that are just too low for your cannon to hit. Unfortunately, they're limited but can be recharged by collecting the proper icons. You can also get out of your tank at any time and fight on foot if you so choose. Does this count as half of a game type? Your character is tiny and so is his firepower. He'll also take a lot of damage so it's not wise to do this until you need to. And of course you'll run across small doors that only your small character can fit in. This is where you ditch the tank and go inside. The second playstyle is an overhead dungeon crawler type. There's lots of these and most of them will make you feel like you're wasting your time, but you're not. If you shoot everything, you'll come across weapon power-ups which are good for boss fights. Sadly, your weapon will revert to a lower level if you take damage though. And if you want to beat this game, then just don't take damage. That's my advice, and it's good advice. It works 100% of the time. You only have a total of 3 lives per continue and very few continues. No saves or passwords, so good luck. Still though, this is an excellent game with an even better soundtrack. This is another game that I've never beat, but it's got personality and gameplay that make you want to keep trying. If you have a Switch, you can also try Blaster Master Zero, which is excellent. It features the same multiple styles of play and does them all extremely well. The graphics go for the retro look that's so popular with low budget modern games these days. The music is also presented in a retro style, sounding like a hyped up NES or maybe a TurboGrafx-16. It's great stuff for sure, approaching the quality of the original compositions. Some of the previous bosses return, but you certainly don't fight them the exact same way you did in the original. And of course you're constantly upgrading your weapons and other powers as you progress through the game. The control is very good, and this time you can save your progress which is very helpful. This is good because levels are extremely large and you'll be in each one for quite some time before proceeding. Of course the worst thing about this game is that it's digital only. And as Nintendo has already shown us, the eShop won't be open forever. So don't delete this one to make space. You won't always be able to re-download it because Nintendo will close the Switch eShop in the future. Move it to another SD card instead. Otherwise, it's a great game. Alright, I'm sick of talking about crappy games. Let's look at Thunder Force 2 on the Sega Genesis. Is it a horizontal shooter? Is it a free roaming overhead shooter? Much to the dismay of the people who can't learn the free roaming overhead parts, it's both. In fact, this game favors the free roaming overhead stages as there are more of these than the horizontally scrolling side view stages. Personally, I like both, though I can understand why Technosoft ditched the overhead stages in later games. These stages are weird and most people are just incapable of figuring them out. They're actually pretty simple. You just need to find and destroy four of these bases that look like this big round thing here on the ground. And it can only be hit with your ground based weapon, so look for the little circles that indicate that the ground is being hit. Also listen for the deep sound as the ground enemies take damage. Once you defeat all four, that's it! 
Some of these can be beaten in less than 30 seconds. Then you have the side-scrolling stages. These are awesome, but at the same time, slightly flawed. I mean, things will fly and attack you from nowhere with little to no warning. It can be tough to remain alive until you learn the game. Oh, and when you die, all of the weapons that you collected disappear and you're left with your default pea shooters. This game is tough. Not anywhere near as tough as Thunder Force 4 or 5, not by a long shot, but it's still pretty tough. Unfortunately, it's often due to the questionable stage design. Still, it's a great early Genesis game with some of the best music on the system. This one introduced the side-scrolling stages into the Thunder Force series, so we should probably all be thankful. Otherwise, your precious Thunder Force 3, 4, and 5 would all be overhead only, just like the first game. Every Genesis owner should have at least three copies. I'm sure they made enough. All right, there you go. Hybrid games, for lack of a better term. Okay, Dave, so if you're playing one of these games that we covered in this episode and mm -hmm. you knew absolutely nothing about it, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the play style switched up, are you going to be happy or sad? Does it make the game better or worse? You know, probably better because, as they say, variety is the spice of life, so why not? Okay, so that means every game should be multi-genre then. No, definitely not. You know, I don't want my Castlevania game to have anything else in it like... Uh, like a driving Yeah, sequence? I don't want to be driving from one castle to the next or something like that. I think that'd be awesome. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> like, like in a Tesla or something? Yeah, something like that, or a horse and carriage. <laughs> <laughs> Tesla. Yeah. Maybe a Ferrari. <laughs> oh, that'd be right. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what are some of your favorite hybrid games that just can't decide what the hell they want to be? Let us know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. I'm really excited for the next time we cover more games that can't decide what they want to be. So I've already been doing some research and I think this is going to be a great game. This is two genres in one game. Dude, you are an idiot. This is two games on one cartridge. That doesn't count. You're right, dude. I, I am such an idiot. God. How about this one though? This has three genres in one game. Oh my god, Dave. Just, 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 no. You should cover one of these. This, this is what I plan on covering for that next episode. The Sega Genesis Six Pack. Six different genres in one game. That is awesome, Joe. You're... I wish Nintendo had a Six Pack. <laughs>